Hi, this is Kevin from the Maths Norris, and in this video we're going to start looking through the Oxford Maths Admissions Test from 2019. We've got the 2020 paper coming up very soon, and I know a lot of you out there are going to be preparing for this exam, so I really help, I hope this helps you in uh, preparing for that. Don't forget, um, I've also done full solutions to the 2018 paper and quite a lot of the 2016 and 2017 papers as well. Head over to the Maths Norris website, all of the videos and things are linked there. Check out the uh, Amazon store and the other things over there as well if you want some interesting recommendations for uh, books to read that can help you prepare for uh, maths at the undergraduate level and just for sort of wider reading and interest uh, if you want to there as well. But I really hope this is useful. Uh, you know, one of the main things I wanted when I set up this channel was to do something to improve uh, access uh, to good mathematics education in particular. Um, when I was a student at Oxford myself, having sat this paper, I did a lot of outreach work and spent a lot of time working with students from different backgrounds and trying to encourage them to apply. So, you know, there are a lot of students out there that get an awful lot of help uh, from their schools and many that don't get as much, but I do really hope that uh, by using the resources that are out there that will include some of these videos, that you can have the absolute best chance of doing well on these tests and securing a place uh, at Oxford or one of these other universities uh, if that's what you're looking to do. So in part A here we've got the equation x cubed minus 300x equals 3000 and we want to know how many real solutions it has. And although our instincts for polynomials should be usually to put everything equal to zero, you know, we're going to take the form of the question here uh, as a bit of a hint and think about these uh, left hand side and right hand side separately here. Okay, so um, if I had the graph of y equals x cubed minus 300x, okay, that's the same as x times x squared minus 300, or x, uh, x minus the square root of 300, x plus the square root of 300 using the difference of two squares, you should be able to see pretty quickly uh, that this is a positive cubic and its graph then uh, looks something like this. It's got roots at zero root 300 and minus root 300 and uh, the right hand side I'll just sketch y equals 3000 um, it's just a horizontal straight line now the question is does this horizontal straight line pass through here through here through here um, and that'll tell us how many roots there are because the number of roots will be the number of intersections of these two graphs okay so uh, so let's say it's there um, but we need to uh, prove that. So really what I want to know is uh, it's just how many, how many intersections there are is just determined by uh, whether this turning point here uh, the y coordinate is larger than 3000 or not. Okay so let's just work that out so if we do dy by dx we get 3x squared minus 300 so that's zero where we have sta a stationary point so that gives us 3x squared equals 300 or x squared equals 100, so x equals plus or minus 10, so we've got uh, 10 and minus 10 where the stationary points are, and if we put x equals minus 10 back into the original equation, y equals uh, x cubed minus 300x, so I get minus 10 cubed minus uh, 300 times minus 10, so that's minus 1000 plus 3000, so that gives us 2000 and we can see that the graph that I've drawn here is uh, how it should be this, this is 2000 so 3000 is going to be above that stationary point and so there'll only be one intersection of these two curves and that means the answer here is B that there's exactly one real solution. So in B the idea is to really do this as easily as possible with some simple cases. It says it's the product of a square number and a cube number, you know, always square, never cube, always cube, never square, etc. Right. So we're just saying can if I take a square number, so let's say a squared, and multiply it by a cube number, b cubed, can that be a square or a cube? Right? Um, and if you think about it, if you made like a a cube number so it would be like m cubed squared and b a square number, you'd have a squared cubed, then you definitely get something that's both a cube and a square number. That's one way of thinking about it. But perhaps that's um, too 
complicated even as a starting point here. I could make the same case here by just taking a equals 1 and b equals 1 and saying that a squared b cubed is equal to 1. So what I'm showing here is that it's possible that it's going to be square and it's possible that it's going to be a cube. So all we've got to think about then is, well, is it always the case that we get a square and a cube number? Well, again, some simple cases, like if I just do a equals 1 and b equals 2, then um, a squared b cubed here is going to be 8. So I'm saying my square number is 1 and my cube number is 8, and the product is cube but not square. Whereas if I took a equals 2 and b equals 1, so my square number times my cube number is now 4 times 1, which is 4, I get a square number but not a cube number. And of course there's tons of different examples you could take here um, with slightly larger numbers if you prefer. Um, but this means the answer is that it's sometimes a square number and sometimes a cube number, um, but you know not always. So with these graphs questions, the idea, if you can, is to try and get away without doing like a really full analysis of how you're going to sketch the curve and you know, maybe do some elimination of uh, from some sort of simpler ideas. So for this one, we can see that the function is defined by this geometric progression, sine squared x plus sine to the 4x plus sine to the 6x plus sine to the 8x, right? So, you know, we could uh, write it down like that, and I'll do that in a second as well. But really, you can try and get the answers to these more quickly by just trying some easy values of x. Right, so for example here, when x equals 0, well sine x is 0, so any power is 0. So when I add all these together, I'm still going to get 0, right? And similarly, you know, if x is equal to 180 or minus 180, um, anywhere where sine of x is 0, we're also going to get y equals 0. So I can immediately eliminate anything where uh, it's not zero uh, those points, right? So actually, uh, we've got rid of this one here because it's there's no zeros here, and in E as well, not zero uh, at those points. Um, now I've got to decide between the others, so let's think about another value of sine that we know about. So if we did x equals 90 degrees, uh, then sine of x is 1. Okay, so actually there I've got 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. It's going to be infinite, or it's going to diverge. Um, and so we need one which has these sort of like asymptotes at uh, 90 degrees and also at minus 90. Uh, so actually it can't be either B or C. So the answer must be D, right? And the alternative here, if you wanted to think of it as a geometric progression would be that, you know, we've got the first term of the geometric progression is sine squared X. Uh, and the common ratio here is also sine squared X. Um, and so the sum here, Right, so, so, so the y is sort of like the infinite sum, right, which is going to be given by a over 1 minus r, which is sine squared x over 1 minus sine squared x. So that's sine squared x over cos squared x, which we know is tan squared x. So you can now just think about the graph of tan and decide, you know, which of these graphs is sensibly uh, that squared. Obviously the slight subtlety with the geometric progression here is that we do need the common ratio to be less than 1, so this is uh, this step is valid only when only for those values where sine x is, well the modulus of sine x is strictly less than 1, so technically this step is not valid um, at 90 degrees and minus 90 degrees, and in fact we can see it's exactly at those points where the, um, where the graph is going to be undefined as well, exactly those points we thought about a second ago where the sum is going to be infinite. So in part d it says the area between the parabolas with equations y equals x squared plus 2ax plus a and y equals a minus x squared is 9 and we want to know what the possible values of a are. So I think the first thing we would do here is to try and think about a sketch of these curves um, and in particular we're going to want to know where these uh, intersect so we can work out the area between the curves. So um, okay, so they are both in the form y equals something so they're going to intersect where uh, x squared plus 2ax plus a is equal to a minus x squared. So the a's cancel here and I get 2x squared plus 2ax equals 0. So I've got 2x times x plus a equals 0. So they intersect where x equals 0 and x equals minus a. Um, and you should then be able to come up with a reasonable uh, sketch of these curves, but there's a slight subtlety in that we're going to, you know, because the intersections are 0 and minus a, depending on the sign of a, whether a is positive or negative, 
that other intersection is going to be either to the left of zero or to the right of zero. Okay. So you should be able to sketch these curves for a typical value of a, maybe just pick like, you know, a, a simple positive and a simple negative uh, value of a here. To do this, I've just put it into autograph so you can see a nice accurate version. And this is the plot with uh, a equals one. And so you can see it intersects at minus one and zero. And you can see the yellow curve is above the red one. And um, if I just uh, decrease the constant to down to minus one instead, now we're going to get intersections at plus one and zero. So, uh, but it's still the yellow curve above the blue one, the yellow one being a minus x squared, of course. Okay, so you should be able to come up with something like that, and then you could. Uh, it's possible to combine the cases here, but let's just do this in two cases. So, uh, let's think about the case when a is bigger than zero. In that case, we were looking at the integral uh, between minus a uh, and zero because this means that minus a is going to be to the left of zero, and the top curve would be a minus x squared, and then we're going to subtract uh, x squared plus 2ax plus a, and integrate that using the area between two curved result. Uh, so I want to integrate between minus a and zero. Uh, we're going to um, see what we've got left here. We're going to get some cancelling a and the a cancels, so I get minus 2x squared here, minus 2ax dx. So at this point, we just need to be able to do the integrals efficiently. So this is minus 2x cubed uh, over 3, and then uh, minus ax squared, and I'm going to do that between minus a and 0. I'm going to be super careful with all the negatives here, so I'm going to get zero for when I put in zero to both of these, and then minus, and when I put in minus a here, I get minus and minus a cubed, so that ends up being plus, so that's two thirds a cubed, and here minus a times a squared, so minus a cubed, so I've got minus a cubed over three, but then a minus, so I get a cubed over three, and we're told in the question that that has to be equal to 9, so, so if a cubed over 3 is 9, that means a cubed is 27, and so a is plus 3. Okay, so that's the case where um, a is bigger than 0. Okay, uh, Now, if I wanted to also do the case when a is less than 0, I'm going to be doing exactly the same integral, but this time I'm going to be doing it between um, 0 as the lower limit and minus a. Right? So I'm not going to write all this out again. Okay, I get um, I, I, it's still the same curve as the top one and the bottom one. So once I put all of this in, I still end up uh, with this line here, minus 2x cubed uh, over 3 minus ax squared. But this time it's between 0 and minus a. So when I plug in here, I get minus, um, minus a cubed. So this time I get 2 thirds uh, a a cubed here and then minus um, uh, um, a times uh, a squared, so minus a cubed, and then minus zero for the other terms. So this time I've got uh, minus uh, a cubed over three is nine, so minus a cubed is 27, and uh, so a cubed is minus 27, and in this case a is minus three. So in the case where a is positive, we can have a is three, and if a is negative, a is minus 3, and so there are two possibilities to the answer here, and so the answer is b, a equals minus 3 or plus 3. So the main idea in question e here has come up quite a few times uh, in mat papers, and it's about using the sort of uh, the, the, the repeating, um, uh, the periodicity, if you like, the, the fact that sine and cosine repeat every 2 pi to think about what certain graphs to do with them look like. This is a particularly hard graph to think about if you wanted to think about it in general, but we are just asked about how many straight lines it includes, right? So the simplest straight line we can think of for a question like this is just y equals x, right? So basically any point on the line y equals x has coordinates x, y. So if I take those coordinates and substitute them in to the equation here, I would get, uh, let's let's say, uh, so if x equals y, then actually the coordinates are not just x, y, but they could you could think of them as x, x, right? So I get sine uh, x minus sine x equals 
cos squared x minus cos squared x, I get 0 equals 0. So for any, you know, any pair of values where x equals y, this works, right? Um, but the point is, if you do something like y equals uh, x plus 360 degrees, or I think I said 2 pi a second ago, so that's in that would be in radians rather than degrees. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, but we can work in degrees here in the map paper. Um, so let's do x plus 360 degrees in degrees. Then uh, if I take a, um, a, you know, a point that's got coordinates x, uh, x plus 360, then this logic still applies, right? Instead of having sine of x here, I'm going to have sine of x plus 360. And instead of this x here, I'm going to also have x plus 360. But because sine of x is sine of x plus 360, um, then this is still going to be 0. And cos of x is the same as cos of x plus 360. So this is still going to be 0. So this pair, this coordinate pair of coordinates will satisfy this equation. So we can see that there are uh, infinitely many straight lines that satisfy this equation. Things of the form x, x plus 360, x plus 720, uh, etc. And there are actually quite a few more. And so if we uh, take a look at this uh, graph, it's actually kind of an interesting one. Um, so you can see all of those lines that I've um, plotted, I was talking about here. So uh, they go. Um, these ones that are going from bottom left to top right, and you can use the other symmetries in sine and cosine to convince yourself that you also get these lines with negative uh, gradients. Um, you know, using the uh, using the other symmetries in sine and cosine. Um, by the way, the, the these are meant to be straight lines. I mean, the the sort of bumpiness of these points is just um, a slight lack of precision. In the in the level of detail that Autograph can um, can compute these two, these should be this should be a nice smooth circle. If I have the axes equal, and these should all be nice straight lines. Um, and you also get these uh, circles, interestingly, in this graph. Uh, and I will uh, leave that as a question for you to think about uh, why those circles might be appear. If you, it might, might appear, and you can um, tell me what the equation of those circles is. That's a fairly easy question to 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 say say what the equation of this circle is just looking at the graph, and then make an argument as to why um, why, why you'd get these circles appearing in the uh, in, in this graph is a much harder question, but I'm sure some of you will uh, think about that and put that in the comments. Um, and then we can have a bit of a discussion of that. But just to be clear for this question, you don't need to do any of this harder stuff about thinking about what that interesting graph looks like in general. You just have to come to this conclusion that there are infinitely many straight lines and in the real uh, exam, of course, as soon as you've come to that conclusion, I'd recommend you move on and uh, think about anything more interesting uh, if you have spare time uh, at the end or after the exam. So I hope that was useful. I'll try and get the rest of this paper out in time for uh, this year's exams for those of you that are preparing for the 2020 paper or perhaps you're watching this in 2021 or 2022 or whenever, and I'm sure it'll still be just as useful and relevant then. Don't forget everything that I've done uh, in terms of videos for these courses will be linked at the Mathsaurus website where I've made some playlists of the questions and there's loads of other stuff out there like the Amazon store with book recommendations and content for GCSE and A-level maths uh, as well that you might find useful or perhaps you've got uh, friends and things that you might want to recommend that to too. Please do like the video and subscribe to the channel, it really helps me uh, get this content out there and I will see you in the next video.